I'm uh, glad to be here. Thank you for inviting me. I've I come all the time. And uh, I, I see a lot of familiar faces and a lot of people I haven't met yet. And I'd like to meet the people I haven't met. Um, you know, you hear from uh, experts. But really, I and they are learning from you. You all collectively are experts at teaching. Everything I know, seriously, has come from individuals and families. And, and other physicians and scientists too, but it, the primary information source is the individual. What is the experience like? What are the symptoms like? How does it go in the family? It starts in, and so we're, I'm taking notes. I'm take, I've learned things this weekend that I haven't known before, um, and ideas to investigate, so this is really, and the other thing that's happening here is um, besides you guys, everybody getting, you know, energized about hereditary spastic paraplegia, primary lateral sclerosis, investigators and myself personally, it is a energizing moment to focus on what's important, make sure we're going in the right direction. Okay, now, a couple housekeeping things. Um, we're going to, I'm going to, I've been asked to shorten this presentation. So I don't know if there's anything else you want us to talk about. <laughs> no, I've been asked to shorten this presentation and therefore lengthen the question and answer period. So I'm going to make uh, only a few comments. And uh, thank you very much. And uh, then we'll have more time for questions. But even during this part, anybody has any questions, we can talk about it. This is informal. So uh, for a, a, a long time, I would always give a talk. Um, when, I, when, this, when this organization first started, even before there was an organization, I would give a talk called um, HSP PLS 101. And I would stand with a flip chart, and I would draw the nervous system and answer questions. And that's how it was. And uh, so I talked about what was the condition. And that went on for a few years. and then. Then we entered this period after the genome was sequenced, and there was a lot of new information. Every year, more genes and more genes. And so then I would always talk about an update, scientific update, new research advances in HSP PLS. And, uh, but last year I said I'm not going to do that anymore because I think, I think the, my responsibility in this organization is to now no longer summarize advances and translate the science, but to make sure that we're charting a course towards therapy. So I'm not talking about, we can talk about, you know, the basic elementary aspects. That's fine. That, no problem. And we can talk about advances, and I'm happy to do that. And I, I always review all the literature every few months, and I always do it before this, and so I'm fairly current. But it, I think we need to, we need to have our focus that we want treatment. And everything we do and everybody who talks should be saying, what I'm saying is in the service of advancing treatment. That's our focus. My focus is not to do science. I mean, only to do science because we want to get there to be treatment. That's our goal. So um, the title is Transforming the Remarkable Advances in, Towards Therapy. And we're going to talk about, and yesterday, I'm glad that we talked about yoga and nutrition, because that allows me to talk about philosophy. Uh, and so I'm going to give you some uh, sort of philosophical comments, and I'm trying them out. And if they work, that's great. And if they don't, then I won't use them. But we'll talk about uh, philosophy of managing science. And, um, and, I, and I, I'm certain that I'll be saying some things that are controversial. And I don't mean to offend anybody in particular, but um, you know, if you're not really making controversy, then you're really not pushing the envelope. And so I'm not trying to be controversial, but I understand that some things may be, um, in some years, may seem controversial. Uh, and we'll talk about therapeutic targets and advances and things like that. OK, so this is the philosophy, and we're going to return to this in a minute. Um, with development, this is a general concept. It doesn't have anything specific to do with HSP and PLS. And actually, I'm probably one of the only people that can say HSP and PLS in the same breath. 
like their one condition. And uh, now this is a, a, an opinion. When the organization was formed, it was because it was on the eve of forming an HSP organization and a separate PLS organization, and that didn't really make sense to me as an investigator, as a clinician, studying these conditions, they're, they're half the people who are told they have PLS actually have HSP, and some of the people who are told they have HSP actually have PLS. And, uh, you know, um, and, and in fact, occasionally we find a person who has PLS and they have an HSP gene mutation. Now, that doesn't happen very often, but it happens enough that we have to say, well, so if some people have PLS, the syndrome, but they have HSP gene mutation, what do they really have? So there has been a tendency um, to sort of separate out. There's PLS and there's HSP. And I understand they have different symptoms. I understand that. I'm not minimizing that. But HSP, within HSP, there's a wide variety of symptoms. But I think that they're more similar than they are different. And uh, I think the treatments for one will, will be treatments for the other. Um, that's my, my opinion. At any rate, uh, but managing science growth, well, let's just talk about a philosophy. Uh, you know, the growth of science has been, in, in this, these fields has been tremendous. And we have to make sure that we are on top of, of directing it and managing it and not just passive about moving along in the flow of it. And so uh, the, the manner, direction, and rate of the growth depends on the balance of the internal forces that we bring towards that, that we direct its growth, and then the uh, availability of resources. So we'll talk about that. But we're going to come back to this. And one other point, and I tell the people in my group this, and that is if you want to stay ahead of the curve, you have to be the curve. That is, you have to be the cutting edge. You have to bring that cutting edge. And if you're not, then, you're in the, then your questions are wrong and your science is, is last year. It, you have to do the important, hard questions, not the derivative follow-up. We we're too small to be um, only doing follow-on questions and application of previous discoveries. We have to make these discoveries. So that, that's what our responsibility. Okay, now, let's say, what are we trying to treat in HSP and PLS? Let's just talk about therapeutic targets. This is general, high-level discussion. What are we trying to treat? Okay, are we trying to treat, uh, first of all, there are no treatments except for symptoms, not today. Uh, but we're trying to make there be these treatments, but what are our targets? What should our targets be? Well, everybody says, well, let's just stop this process. Let's stop the nerve degeneration. That's an idea, OK? And these are not either or. These are a list. Of, we have to decide which ones we're going to go for. So there's, the, there's the, the disease process. OK, so let's talk about HSP. Maybe 90 different genetic types of HSP, each of which is a different molecule that's broken. Sometimes there's overlapping chemistry so that there's a cluster of, of different proteins that all fit in the same molecular pathway. And there are, I'm not going to review that today, but there are probably 12 or 15 different pathways that have, you could put six types of HSP or mitochondrial proteins and four types of HSP are involve the endoplasmal reticulum and three of them involve axon transport and so on and so forth. So you can make there be subsets, molecular subsets. But with, the, with those generalizations aside, should we try to target the underlying process? The nerves, in general, are either not formed completely or they shrink back. These are not all the nerves of the nervous system, but some selected, very long motor neurons in the spinal cord. They're either undergoing degeneration or when they were formed, they were either formed in too few in number or their ends were not sufficiently making enough contact. So it could be an active degeneration process or it could have been a developmental process. But the point is, should we target the underlying process recognizing that we have 
80 or 90 different underlying molecular processes. Okay? That's one. It gets a little more complicated than that because let's talk about spastin. Spastin is the single most common gene mutation for dominantly inherited HSP. 30, 30 or 40 percent of people that have HSP have spastin mutations. So, you know, around this room, three out of ten, four out of ten people that have hereditary spastic paraplegia, particularly if it's dominantly inherited, um, will have a spastin mutation. Okay, so now in our first list of targets, we're going to target the underlying process. But spastin has at least five different underlying processes. I've listed four of them here. So spastin is involved in, in four different molecular um, functions. It's like a pencil has an eraser and a pencil and, and the lead. So what's the function of the pencil? Is it to erase? Or is it to write? Well, it does both. So a pencil can be broken if it no longer has an eraser. A pencil could be differently broken if the lead is broken. Spastin is like a, a Swiss Army knife. It has at least four or five different functions. So if, we're, if in our first mission we say we're going to target the underlying process, recognizing there's a lot of different genes, a lot of different underlying process, we're going to focus on spastin because it's common. OK. Spastin has at least four different functions which, if they're broken, if any one of those functions is broken, you can have hereditary spastic paraplegia. Okay? So which function of spastin, oh, and that's not unusual. Most of the, or many of the HSP proteins are multifunctional. They have more than, like a hammer can hit a nail in. The same hammer has a claw, can take a nail out. So you can break that hammer in a way that disturbs both functions if you break the handle. Or you could break the hammer in a way that disturbs only one function. Well, that's what most of the HSP proteins are. There are many of them, not, maybe not most, many of them are multifunctional. Anyways, I think you get the idea. Just laying out issues. So the next issue is which are, in which cells do we target this treatment for? Well, we say, well, the nerves degenerate, so we have to fix the problem in the nerves. Well, that's not, that doesn't necessarily follow. Because in the field of ALS, it was, was discovered, uh, I think by uh, Bob Brown and his colleagues, that um, you can slow down the process of ALS in animal models of ALS by fixing the problem in the nerves. Or you can slow down the process of ALS in animal models of ALS by fixing the problem in the cells that support the nerves the supporting cells of the nerves, if you make them healthy but don't fix the nerves, they will keep the animals alive for a lot longer. So in other words, it takes a village. If the nerves are, are unhealthy, in the case of ALS, you can solve the problem or fix or improve the problem by, by uh, rescuing the nerves or by rescuing their supporting cells. Now, is that the case for HSP? Is that the case for all types of HSP? I don't know. We have to figure out what are the targets of our therapy. So I'm, I, I have the sense that within about another two sentences, people are going to say, this is impossible. There's no hope. No, that's not where we're going with this. We're going to say that there are problems, and we have to figure out what our targets are and be very judicious about where we're going to apply our energy. OK. Should we replace the gene? Now the other part is, uh, should we, what about just treating the symptoms? Let's forget this business about uh, treating the underlying process, just treat the symptoms. Okay, people say, no, no, we want to treat the problem, we don't want just a symptomatic cure. All right, well let me, let me talk about Parkinson's. Um, Parkinson's uh, therapy since um, 1972 or so, 71, has been revolutionized by the introduction of L-DOPA, levodopa. Levodopa has saved lives, restored function, not forever and not perfectly, but for many years, a number of years. But it does nothing for the underlying process. Levodopa just replaces the chemical abnormality that's caused by the nerve degeneration. So if we had the equivalent of a levodopa for PLS, we would be ecstatic. We have not stopped PLS, but we've restored function 
we've restored the chemical abnormality caused by the nerve degeneration without having tackled the nerve degeneration. So I, I, it, it sounds like this might be, your, an initial response might be only symptomatic therapy is, uh, is not what we want. We want to get the real treatment, but, it, but symptomatic therapy might be more effective than trying to have the nerves slowly grow out at a, at a millimeter a day, you know, over 15 years. It may be more effective to replace the chemical abnormalities caused by the nerve degeneration than to try to, um, it, it, maybe in terms of preventing the condition, uh, to, to stop it from beginning, at the beginning. Okay, uh, so uh, I'm not going to go into this in detail, but I just want to say that one other important thing is that there's a big variation. Uh, one one uh, sibling can have a lot of trouble, and another sibling can have only minimal symptoms. So there's quite a variation. So what causes that variation? What makes it bad, worse? What makes it better, less? If we knew the endogenous background genetic environmental factors that influenced the severity, we might be able to use that information to uh, modify, to, to ameliorate the symptoms. Okay. Now, okay, you got the, it's very complex. We can go for symptoms. We can go for treating the underlying condition. Here's some ideas about how treatments are discovered. This is the mechanistic approach, or a mechanistic approach. That is, you start with uh, the features of the condition. People have trouble walking. The neurologic exam shows that there's uh, spasticity and weakness. From a neurology standpoint, that localizes to the uh, upper motor neuron system. Uh, then you correlate that with pathology findings that show abnormalities in the upper motor neuron pathways. Then you develop a hypothesis that the upper motor neurons are selectively vulnerable to something. When you discover it, you don't know why, but you know that there's a selective vulnerability. Then genes are discovered. Genes, by knowledge of the proteins, you can, you can deduce some molecular pathways. And now you start to put in that these very long nerves are vulnerable somehow, and now we know a list of the molecular abnormalities to which they're vulnerable. And so that gives the concept of molecular mechanisms. Molecular mechanisms opens up the concept of targets of treatment to try to counteract that, and so forth. All right. That's the traditional, that's what's espoused when people say, we want $5 million to find genes, because if we find genes, we can develop treatment. That's the logic of that approach, that if you find the molecular cause, you will be on a track for developing treatment. And that is true, but that's not the only way to develop treatment. And I'm not sure, honestly, if that's the fastest way to develop treatment. But that is, um, that is a way, and it's, it's, it's what, what, I've, what we all, all, all uh, people who are doing molecular genetics um, propose. That is, finding the genes exposes molecular problems. Knowledge of the molecular problems lets you develop therapeutic targets. That le leads to new drug development. It's not the only way. There are other approaches for finding therapy. Uh, one is just the uh, mechanistic insight that is, like for example, Parkinson's. We don't know what causes Parkinson's. We don't know at all what causes Parkinson's. I mean, there are, I, there, uh, there are a number of causes known, but for the 99% of people that have Parkinson's, we don't know what caused it. Um, but we know how to, we know the consequences, as I said before, and so we target the consequences. And the, and the drug discovery for Parkinson's was not an accident. That is, analysis of the brain showed degeneration in selected areas. Those areas were known to have dopamine, were known to be dopamine rich, and so they measured the dopamine in those areas that was deficient. That was a logical concept to give dopamine. It didn't work initially, but um, it, now it does. It, it was modified. Um, and uh, so the, this is a, an aside, but I just learned this and after having been prescribing Cinemet for Parkinson's for 30-something, I don't know, a long time, many years. Um, the met drug is called Cinemet. That's what Levodopa is, modern brand. And I just learned that Cinemet 
was named Sinner. Do you know, people know why? Probably I'm the last person to learn this. But um, Cinemet was named without vomiting. Oh, no, without sin, without e emesis, no vomiting. Because when they first gave L-dopa, it caused vomiting. But when you give L-dopa in the presence of carbidopa, it, uh, you don't get vomiting. So it was called cinemet, meaning without vomiting. Just off the subject, but I'm excited about that. It, I felt like it's been staring me in the face for all these years. Okay, but then there's serendipitous discovery. And serendipitous discovery is, is the, was really led to the discovery of the tricyclic antidepressants, Elavil, Pamelor. And uh, these were not discovered by knowing the biochemistry of what causes depression at all. They were discovered because people that were in institutions who had tubercul in, in state institutions uh, had uh, higher incidence or frequent incidence of uh, tuberculosis. And uh, these were psych state psychiatric facilities, and there was incidence of tuberculosis, and they were being treated with early anti-tuberculosis medications, and some of them had, had a kind of a euphoria or an improved mood on the anti-tuberculosis medicines. And that was observed and reported as being a kind of, I don't know, um, it was before my time, but be, as, a, as an observation that was then followed up and the medications were studied and there were the chemistry of giving those medications and their effect on the adrenergic system was studied and then the medications were modified and so now the antidepressants have no anti-tuberculosis effect, they all only have their neurochemical effects. But the, but the, but the modern use of, of uh, pharmacology in treating bipolar disease and so forth was a, just an accident. It was not intentional. Then there's things like leukemia, uh, I'm sorry, about combination treatments. The, uh, the fact that HIV now is a manageable chronic illness had to do not so much with the discovery of, retro, of antiretroviral chemicals but with the application of drug cocktails, of, of a combination of treatments. I mean, certainly there had to be antiretrovirals, but it was main, the big advances, and similarly the big advances in treating childhood leukemia, were in combination use of agents. Um, okay, now um, then I'm only going to get to number five here and move on, is that um, we, we don't necessarily have to invent new compounds. There's a, a major um, application of repurposed compounds, that is agents that might work that are that have some cross uh, reactivity in the molecular pathway that's been exposed we don't have to make not we might have to but if it would be so much uh, ex more, more expedient if we could use drugs that are already approved by the FDA uh, and we could use begin using them off label that's what we call repurposed drug trial okay so which approach should we take well I think we should take all approaches it's not one or the other Okay, now, so we know about caveat emptor, for, uh, as buyer beware, but how about this new one, uh, considerance fonds, meaning consider the source. Okay, they're kind of related, but if you, I'm a geneticist and a neurologist, so this is not a poke at any geneticist, but if you ask a geneticist which direction to take, they're going to say, they're likely to say, Let's find more genes and understand the genome better, and that's a fast track way to getting therapy. What if you ask a stem, a stem cell biologist? Well, likely they're going to say stem cells are the, are the new thing. You know? I mean, I work with stem cells. I've made that argument. Not very often, but I have. Uh, what if you asked, uh, but what is, the, what is the track record? I mean, let's count them up. I'm not going to do it now, it's too personal, but let's count up the number of times that a, a gene discovery has led, I mean there have been thousands, literally thousands of genes discovered. How many times has that discovery led in the short term, the fastest track for its therapy? Uh, I don't know, of, I mean, not very often. I'm not going to say never, but it's not very often. What about Stem cell biology, how, how fast, stem cell has, biology has a lot of promise, 
But what's the track record today? I understand it's early times, only been five years, ten years, you know. Um, what's the track record so far that stem cell biology being the fast track towards therapy? Well, it, maybe it hasn't been proven yet. But it's not much. The track record of, of a fast track towards therapy is not high right this minute. They has promise, but the track record has not been demonstrated. What about if you asked a pharmacologist or biochemist about the, the utility of making small molecules to advance treatment? Well, nearly all treatments for all medical disorders are through pharmacology and small, small molecule um, biochemistry. That's almost everything we do. And of course, we want better, but uh, OK, it'll give me a seven minute minute warning. So that's been the strength. That's not the new, greatest, flashiest thing. OK. This is a list, a partial list of things to do. And I'm not going to spend much time on this because, um, but you know, we need more research resources. We need more an better animal models um, of the disease. We need models just to treat spasticity. Um, we need more knowledge. I've listed a few things here. And I think this whole um, slide is going to be available. I'm not, you don't have to go through it all in a second. But, um, and we need clinical trials. We need clinical trials of gene therapy, of repurposed medications, of new compounds. We also need uh, rehabilitation strategies. How do you thinking of rehabilitation strategies? There's this um, sub, um, the lifted walking. I forget the name of it, the device where people are lifted or not weight bearing and they're walking and it seems to benefit. Uh, short term. Locomot? Yeah, uh, yeah, right, where people are lit. You, you, yeah, right, you told me that. OK. Now, I'm just take a, two minutes, and I won't know if I have time to show all this, but a um, couple of progress in other areas. So here's Duchenne's dystrophy. Duchenne's dystrophy It's one of these. It used to be uh, the telethon and Jerry's kids. And this is a, 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 an X-linked muscular dystrophy. There's been some progress in gene therapy for this muscle disease. And in the first trial, 12 subjects got a single injection of the gene in a viral vector. One injection, 12 subjects. And the, 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 it's in an in intravenous injection, but the vector is taken up selectively in muscles. And three months after treatment, the muscle biopsy showed that the vector was working like gangbusters. It was putting out the right protein, the normal protein, such that um, 38 to 53 percent, maybe 40 something percent, of the total protein was now the corrected protein, not the mutant protein. And in measuring the blood enzyme of muscle breakdown, the CPK, was a dramatic reduction. OK? That's within three months after a single injection. All right. So let's compare that to HSP and PLS. Muscular dystrophies are muscle disease. This, tar this therapy targeted the muscles. HSP and PLS are not muscle diseases. They're long. They're the disorders of the long nerves, long motor neurons in the central nervous system. And as I say, we're not sure which cells we need to put this into. It was clear there they needed to put it into the muscles. But as I mentioned before, we don't know if we need to go into the nerves or their supporting cells. Um, now, uh, there are some, uh, some gene therapy trials that are being discussed in HSP today in SPG15. I don't see Karina right away, but there, it, uh, SPG15 is under discussion, SPG47 is under discussion, and there are others too. Um, so would we have to give this? They gave theirs in the in the in the uh, in a intravenous injection. Would this have to be in a spinal fluid potentially? But one point I want to mention: this is a key part they can judge the effectiveness of that therapy because they can biopsy a muscle and see if the vector is expressing. They can judge the effectiveness of that therapy because they can do a blood sample and look at the enzyme to see if the muscles are de degenerating. What would we biopsy in an HSP gene therapy? We're not going to do a spinal cord biopsy or a brain biopsy. Where's the biomarker in the blood or the spinal cord that shows us if this so this is, in that one aspect, uh, the system is more tractable because we know what we're looking at. Like, for 
for example, if the vector is not expressing, you wouldn't expect there to be any, any reduction in muscle breakdown. But, um, so we wouldn't know necessarily if the vector were working or not. So there's, that's a problem. Okay, now I'm going to shift over here to uh, spinal muscular atrophy. Uh, and I'm going to run out of time in a second, but that's okay. Um, HSP is a disorder of upper motor neurons, primarily, but also the long ascending sensory pathways in the spinal cord. Uh, this kind of got cut off here, I think, maybe, but I don't know how to change this over. Like, oh, well, whatever. It's okay. But anyways, I'm trying to, I don't know what happened here. Maybe I can, there, how's that? The uh, um, PLS, so HSP involves these long descending motor pathways and the long ascending sensory pathways. That's HSP, motor and sensory. PLS is just the long descending motor pathways, okay? Not the sensory pathways. ALS is the long descending motor pathways and when that cable plugs into the the, the nerves in the spinal cord, the spinal motor neurons, the spinal motor neurons also degenerate. And spinal muscular atrophy is just the spinal motor neurons and out. So these are four related conditions in that same motor pathway. Okay? Now there's progress in, uh, in, um, let's see, I'm supposed to do this. I'm supposed to do open link. There's progress in gene therapy. This will take two minutes if it ever plays it. Uh, progress in, in gene therapy, not just muscular dystrophy, but this is progress for, uh, as Corey knows, um, in uh, spinal muscular atrophy. This is from November last year. Spinal muscular atrophy type 1 is a fatal autosomal recessive childhood neuromuscular disorder that is caused by homozygous deletions or mutations in the survival motor neuron 1 or SMN1 gene. There's not Humans be a also test. have a paralogous SMN2 gene that differs from SMN1 by a single nucleotide, which results in mostly non-functional SMN protein. Lack of functional SMN protein leads to degeneration of motor neurons. This causes severe weakness by six months of age and respiratory failure by the age of two. Two clinical trials examined potential therapies for the disorder with different mechanisms. The first was a phase one study in which an adeno-associated virus vector containing the SMN1 gene this was administered gene by a single intravenous infusion to 15 infants. All of them survived longer and lived longer without permanent ventilatory support than did patients in a historical cohort. Many achieved motor milestones such as sitting and walking that do not occur in the natural history of the disease. Elevation of immunotransferase in the first patient treated led to the administration of prednisolone to all subsequent patients. In the second trial, the phase three INDEER study, which was stopped early for efficacy, investigators randomized 122 infants to receive regular intrathecal injections of nusinersen, or sham skin punctures. Nusinersen is an antisense oligonucleotide that increases the production of functional SMN protein from SMN2. In the Nusinersen group, 39% of the infants died or required permanent ventilatory support, as compared with 68% of those in the control group. In an interim analysis, 41% of the Nusinersen treated patients reached motor milestone goals, as compared with none of the control group. The incidence of adverse events was similar in the two groups. These studies show that both gene replacement therapy and an antisense approach can improve motor function in infants with spinal muscular atrophy type 1. Full trial results are available at NEJM.org. Okay, you got that. So, that's pretty exciting. They gave it as a single intravenous injection in the one case and as a spinal tap in the other case. And uh, children, normally they would not reach, be able to sit, they would die by age two, and there was substantial improvement compared to, they said they had to stop the study early because of efficacy, meaning they could see that it was working, so, they couldn't just randomize people to getting a placebo because it was so obvious. Anyways, that's pretty exciting, okay? Because now they're putting not the gene into muscle, they're putting the gene into nerves. They're putting the genes, now these are the spinal motor neurons, and we need to get up the chain into the upper motor neurons, but the technology exists. Okay, so definitely some room for, let's see how am I supposed to do this? Definitely reason for um, optimism. 
let's see where I'm going with this. Did I do this wrong? Okay, now here's a question. If there's progress in muscular dystrophy gene therapy, and if there's progress in spinal muscular atrophy gene therapy, and I didn't talk about the ALS gene therapies, why is there comparatively little progress in gene therapy for HSP and PLS? I mean, if you look at the incidence of the condition, spinal muscular atrophy is not that much different than HSP. It's a little more common, maybe twice as common, but still rare, you know? Uh, so why is HSP PLS gene therapy lagging behind these fields when we know what's possible? This should be, we, this sh we should be up there. We should be talking about our HSP PLS gene therapy trials. Late onset. Not always. There are children, childhood onsets. There are, there are, uh, I, I, would ha I would suggest, this is personal opinion, I would suggest it's, uh, it's the, uh, we need to manage our objectives and shepherd our resources to accomplish specific targeted aims. That's my suggestion. But uh, some of it is, some of it is definitely the, the disorder, like as I said for muscular dystrophy, we have a tractable outcome parameter to monitor. We can, have, we can sample the tissue. So th things are more difficult, but not, not impossible. All right. Now, let's talk about managing our resources. And this is going to be kind of philosophical. Um, the three models of growth and change. Uh, here's the first model, that things grow and change in the model of how pancake syrup evolves over pancakes. It's applied, and then it just oozes out, and it keeps extending until it reaches a block. But it's not being directed. It's just following a path of least resistance, OK? And the growth is driven by surface attraction and the internal pressure to expand. But there's no, the growth conforms to whatever it, the environment permits. That's a pancake syrup model of growth. And if these analogies don't work, I'll change them. Okay, so now here's the cookie and milk example. You, you, you know, that if you think about how milk is dispersed after you drop a cookie into it, well, something happens and then there's a big splash and there's dispersion after an external event happens. So, CRISPR comes on the scene and everybody goes into CRISPR. I'm not saying I, I go into CRISPR too. But something happens causing a splash and there's dispersal. The dispersal is, in, is caused by the splash. It's not, it, the milk doesn't decide where to go. Um, the other example would be in this, uh, you know, those uh, you, the, the iron filings and then you take the magnet and you paint the face with the iron filings. The iron filings are in a little happy, very placid um, heap. And then a magnet comes in and stirs them all around into some other shape. So, but the iron filings now, but they didn't decide where to go. They're reacting to an external circumstance. So these are two, this is the impact of environmental change, but it's not internally directed. And here's a third one, the model of a, of a pine tree where the growth pattern is not random, it's not reactive, but follows an intrinsic plan to achieve a specific shape. It's, go, the, it's goal directed to achieve objectives, in this case, sun, water, height, seed dispersal. OK, so this is another example of growth. And I'm, these are, an, are um, analogies to uh, the growth that we're deciding on of how we should manage the resources of HSP and PLS community, research community. So which, which of these do you think we should follow? Well, we should be reactive to the environment, passive. Something comes along and a magnet comes along, we run to that. What do you think? How should we do this? You like them all? I'll say we hear votes for all. But I mean, what about the pine tree? It's got this plan, it knows what it's doing. Okay, well, I don't know, there's no right answer. Um, it, uh, but I agree with you, you know? I mean, 
you want to follow your plan. You have to be very specific about what you're trying to achieve, but certainly if there's things changing in the environment, you have to be flexible and adapt to that. Um, so I, I think we need, to, we need to have a strong plan. We need to also be flexible. Okay, well. So these are the things about which we are now deciding our priorities. We have a lot of things to do. We don't have enough hands or resources or time. So we have to be very judicious and, and, and apply our priorities to this. And so among all these, what do I recommend that we do? So these are, ju these are judgments and I revisit this, but at this moment, this is what I'm suggesting. That we find a, a, um, a type of HSP, rare or common, it doesn't matter, that has tractable biomarkers that we can use as outcome parameters for therapeutic trial. I don't care what, if it's rare or common, it doesn't matter. It's got to be the kind of HSP that we can study. Whether it's rare or common, it doesn't matter. It's got to have those biomarkers that we can say correlate with the condition. Um, and we can give a treatment and see if the treatment has an impact on the biomarkers. And why are we doing this? Because if we can show success, we can leverage that success in terms of grants, NIH uh, support, for other treatments. We need to succeed and then expand on our success. So I'm advocating um, treatments for not necessarily the most common, but the most studyable forms of HSP so that we can then make success, expand our resources, and sort of bootstrap our way up this food chain. Um, so, and then in conclusion, among all these options of what should we do, this is again philosophical, what should we do today? Okay, any ideas? Okay, well these are, we should first do what's most important. We have to figure that out. We don't know, but we have to make a decision among our priorities. What we think is the fast track. We have to be, we have to commit ourselves, we have to consult experts, experts have to meet and decide get a consensus, this is most important, high priority, and we have to give it all of our effort. And uh, we need to develop, uh, and uh, Greg Pruitt and I were talking about this, we need to develop uh, benchmarks. If we're going to do something, we're going to say we're going to do it in a five-year plan, that translates into a one-year benchmark, that means there's going to be a six-month uh, mid-year meeting to see if we're on track. If you don't have benchmarks, if you don't track your progress, there is no, then you're not accountable to your, even yourself. So we need to do this as a community. Uh, and uh, we need to empower everybody. Everybody in this room, all the people that are committed to this effort need to be on board as agents of the organization. Not, we, need, we need all hands. And uh, we need to expand our resources and work synergistically. And I'll stop here. Thank you. VA, we are not permitted to prescribe cannabis. So I have never prescribed cannabis. That's not because I have an opinion about it. It's just because of the way I am, I'm prohibited from prescribing it. However, I know about it. And, uh, and last year I attended the Canada Spasticity Association meeting. And I, and I was there, it's every two years, and I was there two years ago. And um, I saw a video and heard and, and, and show, saw a review of their experience tr treating people with spasticity with a lot of agents, including cannabis. And they, uh, the consensus is that it helps treat spasticity. Now, I, I don't think I can speak knowledgeably about the various elements, like is it CBD or the THC or the one that doesn't have any uh, cognitive involvement. I can't give you a, information about that myself. I, I mean, I could after this, get information to you. But their, their opinion is that um, it did seem to help. However, it, is, it seems to be not a black and white difference. In spasticity doesn't just like go away. It, it reduces spasticity. Now, baclofen is also not a black and white difference. Right? I mean, it reduces spasticity. And uh, it and, uh, and medical marijuana may be less effective than baclofen, but it has a different mechanism of action than baclofen. And so it's not like 
it's not like it's the same mechanism of action and therefore if you take more baclofen it's the same as taking baclofen plus medical marijuana. No, they have sort of different and, uh, effects, two, two separate or at least uh, separable effects. Um, and so it might be useful as an addition. My own posture has been like to start with conventional treatments and, uh, and as I say, I can't prescribe it, but I, I, can't, I can't say it's been shown to be ineffective, but it's not, it, it, so it does have some efficacy. Yes, sir. Okay, Botox is a good, I good idea too. So Botox weakens muscles. And, um, and because the muscles are now weak, they have less spasticity. The advantage of Botox, um, well, so Botox works only at the point of the needle. You want to make a specific muscle weak, um, then you put Botox right there. Um, and so it doesn't have the generalized effect. So because it only works at the point of the needle, if you have, I, I recommend Botox frequently when, per, when people have spasticity mainly in certain muscles, like muscles are sort of tight, not too bad, but the ankles are really tight. Well then, that's a good application for Botox in the calves because now I'm really targeting selected muscles. If a person had generalized spasticity, that all the muscles were equally tight, well, I would start with some generalized medication to reduce all the spasticity. So Botox is helpful particularly for targeted spasticity. The problem with Botox is that it, this is the problem and the benefit. Botox wears off. So I know one person, uh, and she's not here today, and she had Botox. All these spasticity really, not the only, but particularly in her ankles. And she had, um, she had Botox, and, and her walking was much worse. Like her legs, her feet were too weak now. And for six weeks, she said she could hardly walk. So the point is that Botox wears off. So if you get too much, or you get it in the wrong muscle, if you're having that kind of adverse response, okay, it's going to wear off. That's the good news. Bad news is if it really helps you, it's also going to wear off. So you're going to get the injection on January 1, and about a week or 10 days later, you're going to be feeling much better, maybe even shorter. You're going to be feeling better, more limber, mid-January, mid-February. By March, it's going to be wearing off. Middle of, by April, it's going to be as though you never had it. And then you'll probably go back. So then there'll be a, a wearing off period, and you'll go back, let's say, in May. So you'll have some on period, then a wearing off period, then a, a period where there's no benefit, and then you're getting in for your next appointment for your next injection. So that's the problem with Botox. By thinking, you know, you can control your computer by your brain waves. Uh, <laughs> well, anyways, uh, so how do they do that? They're, they're do, using EEG signals brainwave signals from the um, uh, premotor cortex, okay? So you imagine that you're turning the lights on, okay? So you imagine you're turning the, or you imagine you're flipping a switch is what it is. You imagine, you think it, and that kind of motor planning actually precedes the movement of your arm. Now, in HSP and PLS, as far as we know, the movement of the arm is impaired, but the motor programming, I don't know if it's impaired. You, know, you follow me? The, mo the premotor cortex or the motor programming part, I don't know that it is impaired. As far as I know, most of the impairments have been demonstrated. Maybe I'm wrong on this, but my understanding is most of the impairments are just in the motor descending pathways, not in the premotor planning pathway. And so maybe we can enhance this part, the, the premotor planning part, to facilitate motor output. Okay. Well, we have, th these are, so, and, so we, we would, what I would do for that is we would get a group of people, and we've already talked about this the other day at the strategic planning meeting, but 
in general, you get experts together and say, we have a problem. We want therapy. What's the best, fastest way? And of course, the uh, geneticist is going to say their thing, and the cell biologist is going to say their thing, and we're going to have to evaluate all therapies and look at track records and say which one way or two ways or limited, limited uh, approach is going to be our directed growth, recognizing that we're going to keep ourselves flexible should there be developments in the field. But we would do it by consulting uh, um, people who have, you know, there's a lot of ex experts in this area. Yes, sir. Doc, you mentioned um, early on instances of people who have been diagnosed with HSP or showing SPG mutations, but actually show symptoms closer to PLS. Yes, sir. Right. Okay, so this is a really this is a hard question because because there are there are big categories. There's uncomplicated HSP, which is just legs only, and and then there's complicated HSP, which involves other parts of the nervous system and other parts of the body, and uh, so it may be it may be legs plus arms, or legs plus peripheral nerves, or legs plus intelligence, or legs plus eyes, or something, you know, something else, ataxia. All right, well, um, the two comments. First, we say there's uncomplicated HSP and complicated HSP. Really, I'm really wondering if there, how common is this uncomplicated HSP? Because if you really look at people, study them SPG4 with uncomplicated HSP, some of them have thin corpus callosum, not common. Some of them have um, peripheral neuropathy, not uncommon. You know, there's other things that people have in the uncomplicated. In fact, in the first dis gene discovery paper of SPG4, some, at least one or two of them had epilepsy. So the point is that the uncomplicated forms, it's probably because, or partly because, we haven't drilled down and studied them intensively. If we had, we'd find other things. But to your point about SPG11, SPG11 is a complicated form. It's got other parts of the nervous system involved, and there are, and that's, and there are more, more complicated forms of HSP than there are uncomplicated forms, like SPG7 is often complicated, SPG11. So, and, but, um, from a neurologist standpoint, the manner in which um, I wouldn't have a, I wouldn't be, I wouldn't in general have difficulty distinguishing the way that PLS affects the nervous system compared to the way that SPG11 affects the nervous system. And part of that is, I mean, they're, they're overlapping. The symptoms overlap, like there's slurred speech. But, um, but uh, SPG11 can have a thin corpus callosum, and that we don't usually see. It's not constant, but we don't usually see that in, in primary lateral sclerosis. And second of all, and probably the bigger point, is that SPG11 often has atrophy, decreased bulk in the hands, for example. That's common, not always, but PLS usually doesn't have that. So these are kind of like uh, not hard and fast rules, but it's a constellation of the signs that would help distinguish. But I agree. It's in, it's in, your, your point is well taken. Maybe. As maybe some people that have classic symptoms of PLS have SPG11, actually. Uh, I don't know if that's been identified yet, but I wouldn't be surprised. I, that would not surprise me. I mean, people have found SPG7 mutations. We have, and other people have found uh, SP, I think Dr. Mitsumoto found SPG7 mutation in subjects with, or one or more subjects with um, PLS. Pretty much. That's how you would, okay, let's be clear. PLS is a syndrome. So PLS syndrome means that there's upper motor neuron impairment, which manifests as increased reflexes and spasticity. That's what defines it as affecting the upper motor neuron. Like those signs, hyperreflexia and spasticity, mean to a neurologist that there's a problem in the upper motor neuron. PLS is a syndrome that has those signs affecting the legs, the arms, 
and the speech and swallowing. And, uh, and uh, Dr. Mary Kay Floater has very, made a very important point. Sometimes it's just the speech and swallowing without the legs, and sometimes it's upper extremities and speech and swallowing without the legs. That's a minority. But the majority of people with PLS as a syndrome is upper motor neuron signs affecting legs, arms, speech, and swallowing. That's the majority. Okay. It's a syndrome. You, could, you can have that syndrome from a gene cause identified or no gene cause identified most of the time. And so, for example, in, there's a childhood onset form due to the ALS2 mutation found by Dr. Sadiq. And uh, that's a, that, in that case, it's a juvenile form of PLS. Um, and we know the cause. It's a particular gene. But this is going to get really sticky here. But I'll just take you into the weeds. In that, just join me. Uh, in that form of juvenile PLS, um, and I could show you a video, uh, it, it might violate confidentiality, so I won't, but I, could sh I have seen children that have uh, juvenile PLS. Progressive spasticity, legs, arms, speech, and swallowing. Intelligence is maintained. Uh, in the case of the ALS2 mutation, if it affects the protein in one place, they have juvenile PLS. If it affects the protein in another place, they have ALS. So ALS versus PLS in that case is due to the different places in which the mutation occurred in the same gene. Um, and, uh, and I was having a conversation with somebody yesterday that um, uh, I think 20% of the people with SPG11 meet criteria for ALS. It's that because it, not because they have ALS, but because of the way it affects the nervous system overlaps with ALS. ALS is a syndrome. It could be due to many different genes and sometimes no identified gene. These are syndromes, not, it, it's a little bit different, okay. Uh, yeah, actually it is a syndrome. I mean, it, technically it means that the condition it is a genetic condition, and uh, it causes weakness and tightness in the legs. It's as a genetic condition. And there are many different causes of it. And often, it's un often we don't know the cause. Uh, but while we're talking about that, uh, uh, we used to, actually, when I started in this business, I called it FSP, familial spastic paraplegia. But a journal editor corrected me and said, not everything that occurs in a family is inherited. So you could have HIV, AIDS in a family. That's a, that's a viral condition. You could have tuberculosis in a family. That's a, a, you know, a bacterial infection. They could run in a family. But the, the, the fact that it occurs in families does not mean it's genetic. So you can, and similar, so genetic means it's caused by genes, gene mutation. And not everything, conversely, that occurs by genes manifests as a family cluster. So a person could have a genetic condition, they could be the first mutation. Nobody in their family before them or, or after them has a mutation. Only they do. So it's not familial, there's no family cluster, but it is due to a gene. You're from a genetic condition. You were. Uh, I. I. I don't. I, I, we have. I haven't met you, but let's say a person has the HSP gene mutation with all the signs and symptoms of HSP. They're born with the gene mutation, and and what determines the age of symptom onset is we don't usually know. Like why does it begin in somebody? I talked to somebody here uh, today, yesterday, and the symptoms began after age 50. Other people with the same, with mutation in the same gene that I've seen begin at age two or five or 14. Why does it begin in some people later? I don't know. What determines the age of onset? I don't know. These are important questions. If we knew what determines age of onset, if we could, let's, let's, maybe we should direct our therapy at that. We're not gonna cure HSP, we're just gonna delay it for 20 years or 30 years or 40 years. You know, I mean, that would be an advance. Figure out what, what makes it come on. Uh, th there are theories about this. One theory about what brings it on 
is that there's very, very like if you imagine a telephone cable uh, and it's got a, a hundred thousand little wires in it and every year 10% of those fibers degenerate. Yeah, but you only need a certain number to make a call. But eventually, at some point, with just a gradual, gradual, slow, slow and steady decline in the number of fibers that make it from one point to the next, eventually you lose the transmission. And so one theory is that nothing brings it on. It's just, it's just uh, slowly degenerating um, from the time it was formed. Another concept is that no, it uh, something induced it to degenerate. That it was, that it was. I mean, and it's hard to know. I we don't we don't know these answers. Uh, yes, ma'am. Yes. Well, that's a pretty good. That's 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 the best we can do today. That's not. That's, that's the best that's available today. I mean, if you, the question was, if you have a DNA test, is that, do we need an, any more testing? The question is, there's two, there's, some, there's uh, uh, one important point um, that I feel strongly about, that um, you do the DNA test to confirm a clinical diagnosis of HSP to confirm a clinical diagnosis of HSP. The clinical diagnosis of HSP can only be entertained, and if I'm shouting, that's okay, but the clinical diagnosis of HSP or PLS can only be entertained if everything else is excluded. So first you exclude everything else. Then, if you say, we've excluded everything else, now we think it might be HSP or PLS, let's do genetic testing. The point I'm trying to get to is we would not do, oh, someone comes in the office, they have trouble walking, let's do a gene test. Gene test shows a mutation. I guess we don't need to check your B12. I guess we don't need to look at your, 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 your neck MRI scan to see if there's any disc bulging. No, we do, we do regular doctoring first to exclude anything treatable, and if we can't find any other cause, then we're going to presume that the diagnosis, I mean, if, it's, if the signs and symptoms fit, that it's a HSP or PLS, and then genetic testing. So you ask if we would need to do other, any other genetic testing. Or other, I would say probably not, but, it, but it, I can't re answer you really definitively because it depends what the test showed. Let's say a person had testing five years ago, and there was nothing definitive, but testing has advanced, and now maybe if we did better testing, we might find something, you know, or maybe there were uh, variants of uncertain significance three years ago, maybe, uh, there could be cases when you wanted to repeat it, but in general, if it's been recent and other things have been excluded, I wouldn't repeat it. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Okay. So, so question is, um, uh, HSP from one generation to the next. Is there something you can do to prevent it? Knowing more about it, could you could uh, prevent the being transmitted? Well, okay. So there's a couple ways. One. This depends on knowing the genetic type. And people don't always know the genetic type. Even if we do um, genetic testing, uh, one paper I saw the other day tested 630 subjects and found 40 per, with exome sequencing and found 40 percent had the diagnosis. That meant 60 percent had no diagnosis. So I mean, I I thought it would be more like 60 percent, but it, I, I knew there's a big undiagnosed population. But um, so if you have to, the ability to predict and the ability to use this information for prenatal purposes, prenatal counseling purposes, depends on having a genetic diagnosis. No genetic diagnosis, you, you, don't, you can't do anything in general, uh, with some exceptions, but let's just stick with that. So now, if you know that this is SPG4, well, 
there are options. One, you can do prenatal testing and you can become, a person could become pregnant and they could be, they could do uh, uh, amniocentesis or chorionic villus sample which is done in the first trimester and uh, find out if the, if the fetus had uh, the mutation and decide if you want to continue the pregnancy or have an abortion. This is, that's one option. There's another option and, and some people know automatically um, that they will not terminate the pregnancy. They know that. But they just want to know, they've had two children to have it, they want to know what's going to happen. So the decision to find out is a separate piece from what people want to do with that information. They, uh, to continue the pregnancy, to not continue the pregnancy, or just to know. Um, that's, this is, these are personal decisions that individuals and families make and um, the uh, American Society of Human Genetics or American Society of Genetic Counseling says counseling is non-directive. Information is given to adults and adults do with that information, are entitled to that information in an unbiased way uh, and so that's fine. There's another, op there are, there's another option that people do and I know several people with uh, HSP that are, are, are doing this and uh, this is uh, pre-implantation testing. And pre-implantation testing says it, that we know the HS, we, SPG4 is in the family and so we're going to do in vitro fertilization. We're going to take, let, let's say, I don't care which parent it is, the mother or father, we'll take the eggs, put them in a dish. So normally ovulation is one egg a month, but the woman would be given medicine, so now she super ovulates, like six, four, four six, eight eggs at once. They're harvested uh, laparoscopically and put in a dish and uh, um, the sperm is mixed in the dish. Fertilization occurs. After 24 hours, um, it's now a two-cell stage. After 48 hours, it's now like a, a, a four-cell stage and it goes to like the eight-cell stage, three days, I think. You get little tiny eight-cell clusters floating around in a dish. And then with, uh, you know, under a microscope, you can remove one cell from each of the clusters and put it in a little test tube. So now you have like seven cells, clusters floating around the dish. And from that one single cell, you can determine, so each one is like, let's say at eight. You take one cell away and you, make, you just say, okay, the number three, five, and six have the gene mutation. The other ones don't. And so they'll take the other ones that don't have the mutation and implant them all. And they try to implant many or several because they don't all, they don't all take. And so then you get, multiple preg you get multiple births. So you have triplets or quadruplets or, or maybe twins or maybe just one. But they would generally implant more than one. Now that's been pre-tested. Uh, so the advantage there, there's no pregnancy termination. Uh, and uh, the disadvantage is the cost and the time because you have to get it, all of that takes time. And then some people have, they say, well, what happens to the, those little clusters that had the gene mutation? Well, that's up to the individual. They can be destroyed, they can remain frozen, or they could be donated for research. And, uh, and so some people have donated those for research. And they're, they don't develop into embryos, but they, they can be maintained as just single cells and studied for, um, studied that way. So is there no way to tell through the partner's genetic, if the partner were to have genetic testing? Well, this is, a, this is, this is a, it, it gets kind of complicated. If it's a recessive condition in the family, if, if you determine that the type of HSP that's in the family that, that you're concerned about is a recessive condition, then transmitting it would require that both parents were, were carriers. If the partner was not a carrier, then, they, would, you, then they, would, they wouldn't transmit the condition. In general terms, there are exceptions. How do you know if it's recessive? Well, you would do, if, you did the gene, if you did genetic testing and you made a genetic diagnosis, you'd say, well, this is SPG4, that's dominant. And this is SPG11, that's recessive. The different types are known. Now, there are exceptions to this. Some of these recessive types were learning 
are not so recessive, they can still be passed on from one parent. But in general, if you knew the genetic type, then you would know, I'm sorry, if you knew the genetic type, you would know how it's transmitted. I guess you guys are pretty, yes ma'am. Wait, 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 here's a question. It rarely skips. It has happened. It has happened. Rarely, but it does happen sometimes. It can skip generations. It, it, in general terms, I, I can't answer. In general, it doesn't skip generations, but that's, they see, generality doesn't matter. That's as a population in the room, but you, you're asking an individual, could it skip? And the answer is it might, it occasionally does. Yes, sir. Okay. The report said that 20% of the people that have this never show any symptoms. Is that something? I think that's the case where, you know, like I have numbers simply that don't have any conditions, but they may have it, and they can pass it on to their kids, even though they've never had a problem. Yes, that's true. That's exactly what we're talking about. Some forms have incomplete penetrance. It means that you could be an asymptomatic carrier, and it it, it uh, and and that's a this is a real problem. It's a real problem. Uh, I don't want to get too uh, detailed here, but if somebody comes in and says, "I have trouble walking," and I have a gene mutation that may or may not cause symptoms, well, is the trouble walking due to the gene mutation that's causing symptoms? Or is there something else that's causing trouble walking and the gene mutation for that person is doing nothing? That's a, you have to be, you have to be, keep an open mind to other possibilities when the condition itself might not, when the gene mutation itself might not cause any symptoms. Yes, sir. Do you know the type? No, I don't. And nobody else had it before. No. Well, see, this is a this is an issue. I understand your concern. You know, um, you know, the, the, you have it as an adult, and they're teenagers, and so uh, you watch them like a hawk. I know the concern there, but the uh, if if we knew the type you had, and if the type you had were let's say recessive. Okay, then we would predict that it's unlikely that your children would develop it. Because in general terms, and I, I say in general because you have to leave some, some uh, space that it's possible, in, but not common, but in general, some daylight in there, uh, in general, if, you, if your type was shown to be recessive, then I would say I, I think it's unlikely that your children would have any symptoms. Uh, they would be carriers, but unlikely they would have symptoms. Recessive conditions usually are not transmitted, usually are not transmitted from parent to child. Un now, let's say the type of the condition you have were X-linked on the X chromosome. Well, X-linked conditions, very rare exception, are not transmitted from a father to a son. Okay? And daughters of men who have X-linked conditions are usually asymptomatic carriers. Now they can pass it on to their sons or not, but they usually don't have any symptoms. So if we, as I say, if you were, if it, this is this is an example of what the kind of counseling we, we go through. If if we knew the condition were were uh, recessive, we would predict your children wouldn't have any symptoms. If we knew the condition were X-linked, we would say your son won't develop it and your daughter, if she, uh, your daughter would be a carrier and usually no symptoms. 
Now, if you, on the other hand, if it were dominant, then the children are at risk. And that risk is 50% approximately. Uh, that there's, it doesn't matter if you have 10 kids or 20 kids, each, ch that's a lot of kids. It, actually, if you got 20 kids, this is not the big issue. <laughs> but, uh, uh, so, uh, but, um, uh, the, the uh, it's, uh, it's an average. So every child has a 50% chance independent of whatever happened to their other, it doesn't matter. It's like flipping a coin, heads or tails, you flip it once, let's say it's heads, that does not influence what the next coin toss is going to be. So if it's dominant, then the children are at risk. And you would get this information by doing gene testing, understanding that's guaranteed to be expensive, approximately $2,000. Insurance usually doesn't pay, sometimes they do. And sometimes we find nothing, or, or, or only ambiguity. Yes, I'm happy. Yes, I'm not ignoring you. Well, um, our doctor told us that there were, I, I believe she said 17 kinds, is that right? Or 17 genes that have, and eight or nine of them have been identified? 90. 90? It was 81, 81 last year at this time. Oh, 81 different genes? Yes. Okay, because my question was going to be, I saw some double digit. Oh no, the testing, like the test, some of the testing will test 260 genes at once. Uh, but we know the names of 80 or 90. And part of this is how, where you define the limits of HSP. You know, like, like SPG7 can cause ataxia and HSP. It can cause coordination problems and HSP. That's SPG7. Well, then there are forms of ataxia that can also cause spasticity. So if somebody has spasticity and ataxia, we might say that's a complicated form of HSP, but the National Ataxia Foundation might say, well, that's a spastic ataxia. So w although we know 90 genes or so um, that cause HSP, the testing also includes other genes that cause other conditions that might be confused or similar to HSP. Yes, sir. So what she just explained is what my wife had cancer. SPG7, mm -hmm. ataxia. Mm -hmm. They first diagnosed with ataxia. Yeah, the sure. The gene uh, with genetic testing shows. SPG7, yeah, exactly. But the thing is, that's considered recessive. Yes. And four out of the eight siblings have it. Yep. Right. The, okay, so this is, you, I'm, I'm saying, when you, when you scratch the surface, it just gets murky. And SPG7 is one of those, when I say that recessive conditions are not passed on. Usually. Occasionally, occasionally, S, okay, SPG7 is an example that occasionally it has been passed on. I think we... Last year, we, we at a meeting in Vancouver, we made a list, I think there were four or five types that are usually recessive, but occasionally can be passed on from one parent to the next. And I've seen this with SPG7, um, uh, that people are with a single copy gene mutation. And so it's hard to know how to counsel people with that. But then our, our kids go, go well, it, So I can't answer this. Yeah. I can't answer because when you say that, um, the uh, father had something, but what age did it begin? Was it a stroke? Was it Parkinson's? What was the actual cause then? Was, uh, there are other conditions of ataxia, and we don't even know if it was ataxia. He just had some motor problem. So in order to say that, it, in, to raise the concern, we'd have to say we have a demonstrated transmission from one generation to the next, means that that person would have to be really clearly proven to have had the condition, and there's ambiguity about that. So I, I don't know if he, maybe he had a, I, I don't know what he had. Um, you know, uh, if... The genetic testing also showed another mutation. He had the testing? No. Oh. So another, like, gene mutation, but they couldn't identify. 
I'm not sure. Yes, sir. Yes. Uh, silver syndrome, there's two, there's a, so silver syndrome, I could, uh, silver syndrome is a form of HSP. It's a syndrome. It's not, it's usually associated with, S, with SC, SPG17, BBSCL2. Um, and it's, uh, it's a form of, it's a syndrome in which there's spasticity in the legs and atrophy of the muscles in the hands. Yeah. It's what they call distal atrophy, and sometimes the feet too. Um, and, uh, and it's uh, atrophy of the muscles in the hands and spasticity in the legs. Now, there's another condition called Troyer syndrome. And Troyer syndrome is, a, is similar, not, ex not exactly the same. Spasticity in the legs, atrophy of the muscles in the hands. There are other symptoms with Troyer syndrome, often short stature, and other symptoms as well. But Troyer syndrome is recessive, and Silver syndrome is dominant. So dominant spastic paraplegia with atrophy in the hands, Silver syndrome, at least SPG 17, maybe other ones as well. Um, Troyer syndrome, there are a number of genes that are, that mutations that cause Silver syndrome, oh, I'm sorry, Troyer syndrome. But they're just, it's atrophy. And the importance of the atrophy is that atrophy, you don't get atrophy by disturbing the upper motor neurons. You get spasticity, hyperreflexia, weakness, but not atrophy. The fact that there's atrophy means that it's that lower motor neuron, something from the spinal motor neuron out is impaired. So it's another neurologic involvement beyond the upper motor neuron. Uh, I can't say. I mean, there, there are, I don't think that there are, there's certainly not uh, 250 people with Silver Syndrome ever described. You know, maybe a couple dozen, something like that, worldwide. So, you know, which is another point. Once you get beyond the big three or so of, of HSP types, we're down into single, you know, two and three families ever described for most types. So, uh, so we really don't know the full spectrum of, of, of symptoms after we get, I mean, there are hundreds of people with spastin and hundreds of people with SPG7 and hundreds of people with, with the SPG3A and, but once you get be, beyond those, we're down into two, three, five families described, you know, or maybe some other ones, you know, but not many. T R O Y E R. Okay, Troyer syndrome. Yet, would that have shown in the genetic test? Yes. Yes, it would. Oh yeah, oh yeah, it would have been tested for. And there are many different, several different genetic types, mutations that cause the Troyer uh, dominant. Three uh, A, uh, which is near and dear to my heart, because we found the three A gene, um, but. Uh, 3A um, typically begins very early in life. Not everybody, but typically 3A begins with the first steps. People are walking on their toes, and it, people are told they have cerebral palsy, and then they say, oh, but my mother walks the same way. Oh, I guess it's familial cerebral palsy. Well, that's, that's not familial cerebral palsy. That's SPG 3A. And so it typically begins very early. It usually doesn't get worse. What you see is what you get. It's usually uncomplicated, but um, there are exceptions to everything. But it, but that's a dominant form, and uh, yeah. Yes, ma'am. Uh, yeah, it would. I mean, it would. If we we uh, we've I've been asked that before, but. I'm not collecting that information today. I might tomorrow. Um, and the reason is, is that we, we were collecting that information. We were. Um, but, it was, but it detracted from our other agenda that we thought was higher priority. We didn't have unlimited resources to do that, so we stopped doing it. 
Um, but and now, uh, so in general, yes, it's a good idea that we, as an organization, that we collect it. I would, I think that's fabulous. I would, I totally support that. I myself don't have the resources to do it, my, but I would, I think we should develop the resources. No, we've talked about developing that or supporting that, and and again, this is the. I think it's. I personally think these kind of databases and and then there's a bio base where you put samples in, very important. Um, the issue is uh, in, in terms of uh, funding for to establish that, and it it needs to be safe safeguarded so that it, it's confidential, and all the kinds of you know safeguards. But um, I think it's important. I support it happening. I'm not doing it because we're doing other things, and it's it's a it's not a trivial task. Yes, sir. So on the on the topic of genetic testing, if a person has a clinical diagnosis of HSP, but then has genetic testing that comes back negative, it doesn't identify anything. Do you hang on to that HSP diagnosis at that point? Well. That's a really good question. I mean, the, uh, okay, so if a per, I, I go like this. What's the evidence that it is inherited? You say, well, it occurred in my grandfather, my mother, her brother, and me, and three of my kids. I accept that's probably genetic, okay? So I'd say there's probably a genetic condition. And so I would say hereditary is a reasonable term. And then the examination, are the signs and symptoms in the course consistent with this? And has everything else been excluded? So evidence of an inherited condition, everything else excluded, signs and symptoms consistent with the condition, I'd say probably hereditary spastic paraplegia. And then gene testing may or may not be helpful to, to uh, tell the specific type. So there, I would say I would stick with the probable hereditary spastic paraplegia, and we use the hereditary because of the evidence that it seems to be inherited. However, let's say there's no family history. Let's say there's no family history. Take that out of the equation. The person has signs and symptoms and everything else excluded. I would not use the word hereditary. I would, I would say, let's say no gene has been identified, and there's no family history, but the signs and symptoms look like look like the condition, everything else has been excluded, I would not use the term hereditary unless there's a family history or identified gene mutation. And then what I, what I call it? Well, I invented the term apparently sporadic spastic paraplegia. That is, it appears to be non-genetic, which allows a wiggle room that if next year we find a gene, we are not wrong. Because <laughs> we didn't say it was definitively not genetic. We just said it appears to be sporadic, not inherited. And that's kind of like a, that, that'd be the best we could say, apparently sporadic. No family history, can't say inherited. No gene identified, can't say inherited. Could be, but, it, but the reason that it goes in that category is because we have to bear in mind that for people, maybe it's not HSP, maybe it's not genetic, maybe it's a form of multiple sclerosis, maybe it's a virus, maybe it's a vitamin deficiency, maybe it's something else. Until we get a real diagnosis, the, the reason apparently sporadic, I like it, because it reminds me that it's not really nailed down. That means we have, if it's not nailed down, means we have to keep looking. Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. Wait, wait, wait a second. Yes, sir. Yes. Right, sure. So, are you, is there an overlap there? there uh, very much an overlap. I mean, the, I, I'm familiar with that. There are dysmorphic appearance and, and, uh, uh, and, and spasticity. The, the, uh, so, yeah, I mean, there's, there are forms of HSP that involve chromosome abnormalities and other, or sometimes they do and sometimes they don't, but there, there are dysmorphic features that we can recognize that geneticists would pick up and make a diagnosis, a syndrome diagnosis. But that, this brings up a big question because, and this is a huge topic, that is, we have 90 genes that cause spastic paraplegia, but 
basically any way you sneeze wrong, you can disturb, you can get spasticity. You can disturb these neurons. So it's kind of a, they're very vulnerable from developmental abnormalities in utero to in uterine infections to lack of oxygen, cerebral palsy conditions to a whole host of different molecular mechanisms from all these genes, many, many ways, many chromosome abnormalities, not just this one, or not just this uh, syndrome, but many conditions um, have uh, spastic, it's, it's very nonspecific. Or not. It, it, there may not be. This could be a manifestation of the ODD gene. That, I'm not, that definitely could be. Yes? Wait a second, I saw your hand. I won't forget you. I just make a note, a bookmark. Okay, go ahead. Well, okay, so let's be uh, I don't want to get personal. I don't want to get personal, but I know a family in Kansas, yes, yes uh, that has SPGA. But at the time that I was involved in investigating this family, we knew it was SPG8, but the gene hadn't been found yet. We knew it was SPG8. We had published that it was SPG8, but the, we knew that that just meant it was the number eight type of HSP discovered. But we hadn't found the gene yet. So I don't know when in this cycle you were tested. Oh, I can't comment. I don't know why. They may, must have made a mistake. I can't, no, if it's been recent times, because it was a time when they wouldn't know what to look for. But if it's been done recently, that, then they made a mistake. That's sad. That happens. Yes, wait a minute, there's a question. Well, this is a, so this is a, this is a kind of a, the question is, is HSP environmental? And caused by things in the environment. And I would have to say like this, that's kind of a, of a, of a, like a dichotomy question. It's, uh, if it's in, if it's genetic, that means it's caused by a gene. If it's environmental, means it's caused by something that's not genetic. But then there's a, Another option that there is, is a genetic condition that's made worse by an environmental factor. And that's speculated. We, have, we don't know of any environmental factor that does that, but we, we, we postulate that that could happen. That, you know, um, so, and I know of cases where that does happen. So, for example, there are conditions like uh, alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, doesn't matter, and that if a person smokes, they have terrible lung disease. But then they have a gene mutation plus an environmental factor. So they have a gene mutation, and if they had the right environmental factor, they have terrible problems. So that's a case where a gene mutation makes them vulnerable, not HSP, makes them vulnerable to an environmental situation. So is there something like that for HSP? I can't comment. Yes, now you had a question. Okay, so your mom was diagnosed. Your mom was diagnosed with SPG7. And your question is, and you know that is recessive most of the time. Well, my question is, will there specific gene analysis tell us if it's recessive or not? No, it won't. Uh, well, uh, it kind of might. <laughs> okay, so when the testing, the question was, if a person was diagnosed with SPG7, does that mean it's recessive? If, a, if the gene testing showed that she had two copies of the gene mutation 
And the report would say either they're homozygous recessive or there are two heterozygous mutations. The, the report would say homozygous, H-O-M-O, zygous, homozygous, me, meaning that they have two copies of the same mutation, or they're, heter, or they're compound heterozygotes, meaning they have two copies, but they're not exactly the same, but they both affect the same gene. It's like, you, you know, if you, you have two copies of every gene, and here you have misspellings, and they're both misspelled, but they're not misspelled the same, but neither of them are spelled correctly. So a homozygous, they're both misspelled exactly the same, and compound heterozygote, they're both misspelled, but they're not misspelled the same. But the point is, if she has SPG7, and the report says that she's got two copies, that both copies are mutant, then it's probable that she has a recessive condition. And if it's that, then there are exceptions, but usually recessive conditions, and this is usual, but usually, and it's not 100%, but usually recessive conditions are not passed on. On the other hand, if they concluded that she has SPG7 and she's only got one mutation, I don't know what's going to happen. Because. I don't know if it's recessive or dominant. Because. She might actually have a, what we call a cryptic mutation that was not identified, in which case it's really recessive. Or she actually could just have one mutation, in which case it could be passed on in a dominant manner. So, the long answer to your question, but if she's got two mutations, I feel it's like, I would interpret it as probable that it's recessive. Does that answer you? The gene analysis should, will say whether there are two mutations were identified or one mutation was identified. In the same gene, two cop, both, both of her copies of SPG7 gene are both mutated. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Um, no, no, take your time. I'm just checking. No, I know. I'm not in a rush. I think we're invited. Oh. <laughs> we're going to crash the party. We are the party. Uh, well, that's a, um, so I don't think I want to, I'm not going to, I'm not going to answer that in the way that, uh, that you might want, because I, one size doesn't fit everybody, and, and sometimes, and I'm not just, in, I'm not just going to give out bland, positive affirmation, but I would say this, um, as much as I would like to be positive and optimistic and encouraging, I want to be very specific and honest about it, and I would say this. You look around the room and everybody's doing this calculation, especially if they haven't been here before and they're, they're meeting people for the first time. Everybody's doing an internal calculation like, okay, that person walks better than me, why is that? And this person's, this person's worse than I am, I guess I feel better. Am I going to become like them? And I feel bad again. Everybody's doing this kind of mental algebra and it's very stressful. Well, uh, um, every, I would just remind everybody that the person that you're talking to even if they have the same genetic type as you, they don't have the, sa the same misspelling as you. Okay? So like, let's say somebody has SPG7 and somebody else has SPG7. Okay, or SPG15, SPG15. A lot of variation, even within a type. Okay? A lot of variation. And we don't, and this I very, feel very strong about, I never, and that's with a capital N, make prediction based on a genetic diagnosis. So, somebody says, I have SPG7. SPG7 is complicated often. SPG11 is complicated often. SPG4 is not complicated, typically, right? I don't make a prediction because there's too much variation. We say, let's just be upbeat, op optimistic, keep ourselves physically active, exercise, and I didn't give you my exercise speech, but I will. But my point is that I would say I don't make a prediction. So if somebody says, I have been diagnosed with a type that's often complicated, does that mean it is necessarily, inevitably going to meet all of those things, bad, scary things I read about? The answer is, I don't know. I mean, I know, people, I know a person who has SPG11 who's a, an architect. 
and I know other people with SPG11 that are having a lot of cognitive issues. So uh, I know the range of SPG11 is great. So if somebody were diagnosed with SPG11, I wouldn't predict which direction they're going to go. I wouldn't make any prediction. I would just say cautious optimism and we'll deal with, you know, the, the short-term past predicts the near future. Okay, whatever happened in the past six months, it sort of predicts what's going to happen in the, I mean, we don't know the big picture, but as far as our, as our uh, physical ability, what we did last six months sort of predicts the next six months. Um, but, and what we did, but I, and maybe the last 12 months predicts the next 12 months. But I can't see two, I can't see two years ahead. That's one. A lot of variation, no prediction, even within a genetic type. That's the first message. Second message, okay. Many people with HSP and many people with PLS. So many means a lot, but it doesn't mean all. Many people with HSP and many people with PLS, at some point, the condition seems to slow down. I would call that a plateau. The word plateau is not accurate because that means flat. It's not really flat because age goes on and our abilities to perform decline with age. So the abilities decline, but the, it seems that the rate of decline is about the same rate as age would cause decline in physical ability. My point is, you know, the fastest runners in the world are getting slower at a certain rate. And so when we, so my point is that many, not all, people with HSP and PLS, at some point the condition seems to reach a plateau, relative plateau, meaning thereafter any further worsening is only at the same rate as age would have its effect. Okay, for example, I saw I, 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 many dozens of patients have, I have records on that establish this, and I've, where we see them year after year and videotape them, at, at some, you know, 10 years, 15 years. Um, not a lot of hard measurements in terms of walking speed and, and six minute walk, things like that. Not a lot of those measurements, but clinical exams and videotapes. And one case example, one person example, was a, a woman who uh, was normal in grade school and in about sixth or seventh grade she started having trouble walking. In seventh or eighth grade, I don't remember the details, she um, had a lot of trouble walking, was now using forearm crutches. By ninth grade she was using forearm crutches and bilateral ankle foot orthotics and had a lot of spasticity in her legs. Nothing in the fifth grade, maybe sixth or seventh grade onset, but by ninth grade a lot of spasticity in her legs. And I started seeing her like the eighth and ninth grade, and I followed her through high school and then through college, and she graduated. I haven't seen her in the past couple years. Well, after about the 10th or 11th grade, and then all through college, where I saw her for every year for five years, for those five years, no change. So she had an onset in early adolescence. It got worse for a few years and then reached a plateau. That's not uncommon. I've seen many people that do that. I've seen that in uh, m many people that I see annually and I say, I don't see a change, I don't see a change. Now some people, there is an inexorable decline. This is not 100%. The second message I would say in response to positive is that be aware that the condition may not be changing. It doesn't necessarily mean, if you have HSP, I would say that there's going to be an inexorable every year for the rest of your life worsen. Maybe there will be. I can't predict. I would, I would say the course of HSP can be one of eventually the condition slowing down. And uh, I've observed that. Many people have observed that. And uh, so why that happens, I don't know. Now, it doesn't happen for everybody. Um, and uh, so worsening during growth spurts in childhood and then a plateau thereafter, that's not uncommon. Or after four or five years of symptoms uh, and th the condition sort of reaches a plateau, that's the second thing. Just be aware of that. Um, that's a little. Uh, we, we wish we could. We wish we could stop it. But we don't know. Anyways, but the third point I would say. Did I give you my exercise speech? Okay. All right. You ready? 
I think exercise is a good idea. <laughs> now, this is not scientific. Okay, I'm getting a five minute warning. This is not scientific. But uh, because uh, uh, we were going to do a study about the impact of 20 years ago, we were going to actually use murder protocol to do a study about the impact of exercise on, on primary lateral sclerosis and HSP, and we decided not to do it because everybody was saying, if I exercise, I'm better. And I felt like we should do something else with our time rather than this. We never did the study. There have been a couple studies published, not exhaustive. There needs to be more, more research on this. But the reason I endorse this is because people have told me two things. They've said, if I exercise, I'm better. And if I stop, even for a week or two weeks, or um, briefly, or the, somebody here who I don't want to mention any names, had surgery on their foot and, didn't, and wore a boot for a while and significant decline during that period of when they couldn't exercise. This is very common. Um, uh, that is, ex people have told me I'm going to say a few hundred people have told me exercise helps. And when they stop exercising because of circumstance or injury, they get worse. So uh, I just, then I go to the next person, I say, you know, so and so told me exercise helps. Why don't you try this? And over time, people have developed strategies. And uh, we, there's, so I, I, um, you know, um, there's belief, which is faith-based, and there's thinking, which is rational, based on evidence, and there's not much evidence that would support this. So I'd have to put it in a belief-based, but uh, people have told me that I, I'm con I, I, I uh, support it and encourage exercise. And what kind of exercise? Well, if you're weak, the muscles that are weak need strengthening. And if you're tight, those muscles need stretching. And, sometimes, and typically, there's a pattern of weakness. So like some people have weakness of their, of their hip flexion. Other people have weakness of bringing their foot back. Some people will be just weak every place. Some people will be, will be weak in lifting their legs, but they're bending their feet back is fully strong. And their main problem is that their knees are in because their adductor muscles are too tight. Everybody's got a little different pattern. So the person who has adductor tightness, you know, bringing their knees in, they need stretching. They don't need strengthening. They need stretching, stretching, stretching. The person who has trouble lifting their legs and has to throw their pelvis back in order to walk, they throw their shoulders back to tip the pelvis up to encourage the leg to come up, they need hip flexion strengthening. You know, so the point is, everybody has a different exercise prescription. Or probably, there might conform to like one of five different exercise prescriptions. But in general, it's all individualized. Somebody really needs to work on their balance. A, some, a person who also has some SPG7, for instance, that also affects their cerebellum, they may have particular balance problems or peripheral nerve problems that makes them very unsteady. They need balance exercises in addition to strengthening and spasticity and so on. My point is, uh, work with a a physical medicine physician and a, a trainer and develop a program to work on individual problem areas. The type of exercise is both specific to, to strengthen a specific muscle or to stretch a specific muscle as well as contextual exercises like, um, you know, uh, yoga and that involves the whole body or swimming or horseback riding, or climbing gym, or walking, or whatever. The whole body engaged um, is one type of exercise. And then, in addition to that, specific targeted exercises for the specific problems. And, uh, and, and not, don't stop. More is better, but don't injure yourself. But more is better. Whatever you did last week, whatever you did last year, do more this year. Uh, just, you know, put it, this is a lifestyle thing. And I'm, the reason that I, I'm going on about this, because people who have, people, if you inventory people here, I'm not going to do it, but inventory people, people say, when I exercise, it helps. In general, people have told me this. When I, uh, 
Um, when I ex exercise, it helps, and when I stop exercising, I get worse. Okay, so that's my speech. <laughs>